Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, to all of you for coming. I'm very conscious of how close we are to Thanksgiving and the dire reports of traffic um, that those of you who will be travelling are going to have to face. So it's fantastic that you've taken time out this morning to be with us. Though I am not surprised uh, because of our guest uh, who's with us today. Just a quick word about the Global Europe program, which I chair for the Woodrow Wilson Centre. This is a program that we've designed to do something a little bit different because it looks at the pressures and stresses uh, and issues that confront the continent of Europe, whether that's the Arctic and the issues of climate change and trade, whether that's migration, whether that's the big relationships with Russia, with China, and of course with the United States, and whether it's issues that confront it in many different and challenging ways, of which um, our guest, Alex Rondos, will be able to talk extremely eloquently, uh, in this case, around the Horn of Africa. Um, Alex needs probably no introduction to any of you. He has been the uh, European Union Special Representative for the Horn of Africa for, he tells me, eight years now. Uh, is based now in Nairobi and has been working on issues that concern all of us uh, throughout his long career, but perhaps especially now on the Horn of Africa. And I'm going to begin by asking him a few questions and then invite you to join in the conversation. Uh, this is on the record. We have uh, C-SPAN here. We're delighted to see you. And we hope that people watching this will uh, enjoy it as much as you will. So it's a great delight, as you know, to have you here, Alex. Uh, I'm a huge fan of everything that you've done. Um, and I know how much uh, you have contributed to thinking through the issues, the policies, the ideas, the objectives of what uh, Europe, but not just Europe, can do in the Horn of Africa. But begin by telling us your remit, the geography of it, the politics of it. What do you cover? Well, thank you, Cathy, and a good morning to everyone, and thank you for, for coming here. Uh, delighted to be uh, your guest. You, you were the one who first set me off on this jaunt in the horn, and it's, it's rather lasted. And um, you know, my hope was always that at least I would keep, I, I would try to keep it out of the crisis in tray for you. Um, the remit geographically is uh, the, the traditional horn, but expanded to include now Sudan, South Sudan, so it's Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, South Sudan, Djibouti, Somalia, Somaliland, as part of Somalia, as it were, Kenya, and um, Uganda. So it stretches down into some Eastern African issues. It, <clears throat> the EU arranged it in such a way that the remit was to be sort of all things to all people, um, as the EU does. It sort of has clauses and sub-clauses to every text and order that it gives. But at the time, the real hot issue was Somalia, eight years ago. Um, piracy, how to deal with Shabab, where would so Somalia go? And Somalia is part of the region. So the remit really became one where I was the only person who had such a role, which was unusual. Uh, secondly, that a lot of the people, the leaders in the region, I think were surprised, pleased, that there was an attention being given at a political level. And, and frankly, you know, you gave me um, kind of a, an open book, as it were, to be as entrepreneurial as possible in dealing with all the different crises. But what emerged, and, and I think this is where, from a European perspective, we could play to one comparative advantage that we have, which is that in the EU, we're dealing daily with squabbles among member states. The question is we created a framework within which, at the very least, you don't pull guns out on the whole, and we haven't for a while. Um, 
and therefore trying to get a, a whole region which was, you know, despite its geographical name of the Horn of Africa, is a pretty disaggregated place. It's not integrated in the way that other regions are. And therefore getting the countries among themselves to get used to finding ways of communicating with each other, preventing crises. And a lot of the work that I've ended up doing is stuff that just doesn't appear in the public eye. It's, uh, nor do I spend much time seeking permission to do something because you have to move fast um, in order to, to resolve issues. So it involved Somalia and its neighbors, Kenya, Uganda, uh, Kenya and Ethiopia, Ethiopia above all, and certainly lately, uh, Sudan, South Sudan, Sudan in its wider setting. And as things have developed, it's really become about how this region called the Horn, one begins to resolve its internal national disputes that it has, of which there are a number, and we'll go into that, the relations among the countries, and the most recent challenge is situating and helping a region navigate its way into a, a completely changed geographical landscape. The dynamics coming from the Indian Ocean, from the Gulf, are totally altering the balances. And from a European point of view, and, and I'll just conclude on that, our challenge then is just to say, well, are we as Europe, this is the sort of soft underbelly of Europe, it's just immediately below North Africa, um, and, it's, and it's on the, 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 on one side of the Red Sea, where all, a lot of our trade goes through, are we in this changed global setting, and given what is going on in the region right now, uh, going to become spectators, or how do we engage and how do we define our interests as Europe in this changed setting? So it's, um, there's a lot of firefighting and, and occasional attempts to be prophetic and translate that into some kind of longer term policy. I told this story before uh, a few times in my life, but when um, Somalia got to the point of having some kind of government, I remember flying in on a cargo plane with you to the airport mm -hmm. in Mogadishu when the control that the government had was probably a square mile, and we had a tin hut and a flag and a bed and a bedside table, and that was the embassy, and we put you in it, and I have a photograph of you lying on the bed uh, in the tin hut, and then we, we raised the flag of the European Union uh, as a means of showing that although we could, we could hear that there was a lot going on a mile away, that we were committed to trying to support the people of Somalia and through them the people of the Horn of Africa. I mention that because that for me was a kind of beginning. Mm -hmm. Eight years have passed. What's changed? What's the thing that you really notice or the things that really strike you as different, good or bad? Yeah, it's... Um... <clears throat> This country is going through a transition, this country, this region, and key countries within it, notably Sudan and Ethiopia, but also Somalia, through a transition of a depth that is akin to what Eastern Europe went through in the early 90s. That is how deep the change is in this region. And I think that's the first thing to bear in mind. Secondly, we need to understand why this is happening. And we need to look at demographics. 70% of the population is under what? 30, 31, 32. And we all need to wake up and understand that this generation has now gone politically operational. And we will be making a serious mistake if we think this generation should simply be treated as numbers in a development project, you know, to have the umpteenth youth project. Lovely, but they're going in another direction, which is to say we intend to have a say in what we think we belong to. Do we outside understand what this entire generation, it's a, dam it's a, it's a demographic tidal wave breaking over the politics of the region. And that's, that's just mathematical. You don't have to be a political crystal ball gazer. 
to, to, to understand that. But do we know enough? Do the leaders in these countries even know enough about what is going on? What are these aspirations? What are their loyalties? So that is the fundamental change. If you look at what happened in Ethiopia, and look at what happened in, in Sudan, you see this, this, this youth bulge, as it were, just suddenly becoming political. Protest is meeting politics. Is politics capable of absorbing protest? Is, is really what's going on in, in, in this region. And it, it'll take different shapes. Uh, therefore, what's happening in Sudan and Ethiopia, for example, 150 million people. Those are the sheer numbers that are involved. The fates of both those nations, I think, are, are up for grabs. What is happening is very exciting. Are we outside ready to speed up, scale up, get engaged in a way that's needed? Or will we be you know, polite bystanders making interesting analysis while this goes on? Why? Next question, big change, is that the region has now be become part of a whole new set of global, a global competition that's going on. The politics and the geopolitics and geoeconomics, as it were, of the Indian Ocean have spilt over into the region. It's not what we're doing. It's not what the United States is doing. It's what China's doing. It's India beginning to show a real interest. It is the Gulf realizing that they have a Western flank and literally strategically doing a 360 degree turn and saying we've ignored that other side of the Red Sea. So the engagement, I think, is there. It is irreversible. And it begin, at the moment, what's happening is it looks as though there is, if you will, a new scramble, not just for this region, we should look way beyond. Um, that scramble, the only difference, the methods are very similar. It's about finding local clients, local collaborators, and the like. And the only difference is that we Westerners and the former colonialists are, are kind of bystanders and watching this. New, and the assumption that we were the players in this region, I think, is changing. Um, now, where that will go is, the, is, is huge in, in terms of its implications. Um, and, I, and I think you know, it behooves us all not just to analyze it, but ask us where we fit. Why? Final point. If we agree that there is a new generation emerging, which is going to be decisive in how it defines the interests of their communities, their nations. Um, and my working assumption is that many of the aspirations that generation has are, are not dissimilar to the aspirations we have in the West for our children. Um, are we doing enough to engage that generation? So, our policies have to be very, very carefully calibrated here because it's a very, how can I put it, plastic moment. Um, and, and who we align with, I, I mean the simple challenge as I put it to certainly the member states of the European Union is, are we going to end up on the right side of history? That is how deep the change is. And I'd put the same question here too uh, in the United States. It is unstable, it is uncertain. We have a view of stability which includes acknowledging that the popular will has a role if it is acknowledged. Many of the other players who have chimed in do not represent what I would call a sort of a, a, an illiberal as opposed to liberal approach to politics. And that is where we have to work out whether Stability from the barrel of a gun can be replaced by stability created by a more participatory politics, which is what is being forced on some of these countries. You know, one of the issues for Europe, and I think for the US, is in a world where there are so many different challenges mm. that confront everyone, the crises always get ahead of mm -hmm. what you might call the strategies that can prevent the crisis that may be coming towards you. 
if you if you could change things, if you could um, have the resources or get the political attention or whatever it is from European Union or Europe more generally, uh, politicians and political thinkers, and indeed in the US, what are the ingredients that you think could make a difference? You've talked about being aware of the value of popular will. You've talked about the players who are coming in from the Gulf to China to India and so on. What is it that you think Europe, the US, could and should do that could make a difference to the future of these extraordinary young people? Uh, objective one is if we agree that there is a transition of, of tectonic significance that's going on, and it's the generational one, we've got to make sure that that transition in political terms gets stabilized. We, have, we all say, and everyone immediately when they engage in a transition, say they'll have an election. Every single one of these countries is going to have an election in the next two to three years. Well, one to three years. Um, in countries going through profound changes where it's not quite clear whether the old still has a grip or whether the new that's coming in will grab the grip, as it were, on, on the political machinery and in countries which, you know, do not yet have deeply embedded in an institutional capacity to act as shock absorbers that come and must address the, comp the competitiveness of electoral politics. So what therefore needs to be done, this is the next two or three years, otherwise we're, frankly, this is just, it becomes an, in, an interesting but academic debate. Um, where Europe can step in and has every interest of doing so is to, is to begin to convene everyone from outside to say, let's make sure that we don't pick apart and allow a region to be picked apart by the old methods of the past, historically. Um, and so, it would be about bringing and talking to the Gulf and engaging in a very straight discussion about this. And the Gulf, I believe, got a bit of a shock when they saw the reaction to some of what one or two Gulf players were doing at the beginnings of the changes in Sudan. Um, the street basically said we are, they objected to what some of the Gulf players were doing. Fine. Mistakes occur, misjudgments occur, but they reflect deeper inclinations. We need to get everyone around the table and come up with a common understanding on what it's going to take to stabilize. Two, resources. The money simply is not there to meet the aspirations of people who had been told for years, wait and the good life will come. Frankly, in the meantime, the leadership was going to the global pawn shop called the dead market and selling the family jewels. That's, in effect, what's been happening. So we have a massive debt problem that has reemerged, which is going to further create problems to meet the aspirations of this generation who are becoming very political. If they don't feel there's a purpose to which they can work, they will go in any other set of other directions. Their loyalties will go. Now, we've therefore got to think about how you mobilize money. And to sit there and say, we Europe don't have enough, or the United States doesn't have enough, is not a policy at all. The policy is, how do you mobilize all the resources that are available and work out who can, what's, what's the business plan and the cash flow plan, if I may put it in very simple terms, that begins to address the aspirations. You simply cannot tell um, of 100 million Ethiopians, 70 million are kids, half of them kids, 30 years old, I take the liberty um, of, of, of that, of saying that. Half of them are men who are unemployed. Well, what do you expect when it comes to election time? What is it one is able to offer? And I don't mean just charity. It's about real new types of investment. It's about getting governments to understand what can be done. 
if the international community is not coherent, it will merely reinforce any incipient incoherence in the region. We will mirror each other. And then we'll be sitting here in a few years' time wondering what went wrong. And the answer would have been, we ironed the wrinkles into the shirt instead of ironing them out. That's, that is the core, core question at the moment. And I think we've got to have the self-confidence to say there are certain things we believe in and we're ready to invest in and bring others on board. And I mean anyone. The object is to put some coherence into the international system at the moment. And that I have, I have a lot of faith in an emerging generation which is totally wired and connected. Okay. They, they're talking across frontiers. They know everything that's going on globally. There is a nucleus there of new leadership that can be emerging that I think could begin to reshape some, some of the politics of the region. That is what I think we need to be doing, if that isn't too general, but that has to be in a strategic objective. If we set, stabilize the next few years, then there's the breathing space then to look at, ne at the next stage, by which time you hope that the new generation is gonna express itself and say much more clearly what it wants rather than what we think it should want. So my last question is, when you're lying in your bed in Nairobi thinking about all of these issues, thinking about the potential of this young generation mm -hmm. and the connections that they make, but also the challenges that they're going to face mm -hmm. with such high levels of unemployment, the push towards elections, which I always describe as the cherry on the icing on the cake mm -hmm. of democracy, mm -hmm. um, and the assumption that gets made so often, particularly in countries going through transition, which is chaotic, that if only they can have an election, everything will be fine, rather than understanding that that does not give them mm -hmm. all that democracy has to offer by any stretch mm -hmm. of the imagination. When you think about this landscape, what keeps you up at night? One is that there are sufficient individuals of, of considerable influence in the region, but also outside, for whom it is not in their interests to go down this path. Um, deliberation is a painful, messy business. Um, uh, you know, that, that's democracy, okay? Two, and here's the, I think, the key issue that scares me, and I think we are asleep at the wheel. Um, yes, terrorism is there, uh, and I don't mean to in any way diminish it, but I'm seeing something else in the last, and you asked me what are some changes that have occurred in the last eight years or that I've been doing this. It is what, and I, and I want to be clear, this is not just about this region. It is the rising criminalization of economies and politics. What we saw in West Africa, the org international organized criminal syndicates are saying, hmm, the Horn of Africa, that's a useful place through which we can operate. And the more you open up, people flow in. Likewise, regimes that are very closed actually are using criminal methods in the management of their economies. What's the point here? One of the very interesting things that's occurring with what the youth are saying, when you really listen and look at the social media, they're asking very simply, where has the money gone? All right? A question that some of us would have asked of our own governments at other times, all right? Now, so this is not a, you know, a unique to this particular region. This is fundamental. Um, Simply talking about anti-corruption is not there. It is a criminalization run by emerging cartels who risk, and the risk is that they will begin to capture parts or whole of states. Now, fortunately, there are people in governments who see that and know it. 
But it is fascinating that this is what's emerging. And if we don't wake up and understand that terrorists are in effect piggybacking on this is one. Al-Shabaab has become effectively a self-financing organization. That's what it is. is. In other words, is this a terrorist organization or is it a mafia operation cloaked and wrapped in religion? Okay. These are questions we need to dig in much more deeply because if we don't, we end up being, we're going to get surprised uh, with some really nasty stuff. In other words, follow the money but get serious about it. Governments must do it. We must do it. South Sudan is a classic example. You know, we're on the record. I will repeat it. I fail to see why we should be investing in a country where we're engaged in an exercise in moral hazard. We're negotiating with the same people who stole the bank right now. And we're being asked to get ready to put more money in. Well, I'm not sure I would ask European taxpayers to do that. Keep the indigent, do, you know, do the basic humanitarian, yes, but what, how do we address that? How do we address the fact that other countries in the region, their networks are complicit in this? Sudan, we want a civilian to see the civilians begin to get control. Fine, in a country which has had 30 years, the longest single Islamist regime, which created its own economic cartels, those we barely scratch the surface. How do we deal with that? It's not just us. We've got to talk to others who, want, who are also engaged, friends in the Gulf and elsewhere. But if we don't begin to get to the heart of that, we will have missed a trick, and the people of the region will have felt that they've been tricked by nice words, quaint projects, but in the meantime, the runny, money's running Venezuela, as it were. Follow the money. Alex, thank you from me. Now, this is your opportunity for comments and questions, but all I would ask is if you could keep them relatively brief because we want to hear more from him, uh, important though you are. There, I am reliably informed, and there is the wonderful Mary with a microphone in her hand. So there's a gentleman there. If you could just say who you are, just because we're curious. Yeah, uh, my name is Bashir Goth, uh, and I represent Somaliland here. Uh, I know Ambassador is w very well engaged with Somaliland, that's why I'm going to ask you this question. I would appreciate if you reflect on, this, on Somaliland in terms of its contribution to peace and stability in the region, uh, in combating terrorism and piracy, and it is political situation in a changing Horn of Africa. Thank you. Somaliland is in a very interesting historical position. Um, this is in a region unique in Africa, which has already seen two secessions legitimized, if I may put it that way. And you representing Somaliland would probably want to be the third that is legitimized. The reality at the moment is that I'm not going to get into whether you'll get recognized or not. That is for your neighbors, your own people, your neighbors, Somalia itself, the African Union and others. Um, but there's absolutely no doubt that so long as Somaliland can continue to show that it is keeping stability, and it would help if Somaliland, which showed that it could maintain some stable politics, rotation of elect electoral processes and the like, would actually stick to that, because right now you sort of have run a bit into the sand on that. Um, I think only time will tell. What I, what I would suggest is that Somalilanders, um, your, your deep aspirations notwithstanding, should be watching very carefully what is happening more widely in the region. Uh, is there a wider context within which so Somaliland can fit its aspirations in such a way that it doesn't become too narrow and particular, but fits into a wider regional set of arrangements. Because that's where the future really lies, not just vis-a-vis -vis Somalia, but all, your, all the neighbors of Somaliland. We need to get very imaginative and think out of the box at, at the moment. Okay, next question. 
I'll take one this side. Hey, good morning, Ambassador. Uh, I'm Rob Hopkins. Uh, I've had the pleasure of living and working in uh, Kenya for a number of years. Uh, and I, I wonder if you could share your thoughts on how you see Kenya's role specifically in the region um, outside of the, you know, exporting security to Somalia and things of that nature, the internal struggles, struggles that Kenya has, uh, and whether they're able to, or if they have a capacity to be an exporter of security, or what other roles do you see them in the Horn of Africa writ large? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Kenya's an economic powerhouse in the sense that it has this incredibly vibrant economy. Um, and long may that last. Uh, it's just a question of making sure that the redistribution within the system works. I think, secondly, Kenya is going through its own exercise of reviewing its entire constitutional arrangements post-2007. In effect, what we, and Kenya is emblematic in a much more sophisticated sense of what's happening in the region. We talk about democracy. The real issue is how do you get accountability and how far do you decentralize in a region where you still have incomplete national projects? Okay, this is the, the interesting and fascinating dilemma of this region. So, you know, we talk about federalism in Somalia, Sudan is the same, Ethiopia today. You know, it's how do you move beyond an ethnic federal country to something else. Kenya has its own version, and they created 48, seven counties and the like, and you've got different views on this. Does that mean 48 points of corruption or 48 points of accountability? Usually it's both, anywhere, not just Kenya. So there's a whole debate going on there. If they can take this to another level where they begin to create a greater cohesion um, within the country, that will make Kenya an absolutely solid platform to be able to play, I think, a really important role in, in a region which, as I say, that is otherwise changing incredibly rapidly. In terms of its role in the region, Kenya straddles East and Central Africa as well as the Horn. The Horn, whereas East and Central Africa is the natural economic uh, zone for Kenya, the Horn has been more one of sec a security concern. And Kenya, I think, has a role to play. At the end of this week, there's going to be a, um, a, a summit of EGAD, the regional, uh, the regional uh, organization. And it's very possible that at that summit, uh, Ethiopia will hand over the chairmanship to Kenya. That is an assumption that people make. Uh, we, from the European side, would welcome it and have told the Kenyans that if they assume we'd be very happy to be able to be as supportive as possible, and it's going to mean real engagement on Kenya's part to facilitate not only on Somalia, where it is pretty heavily invested in different ways, but um, helping with Ethiopia, helping with South Sudan, and the like. So it's, if it takes on this role formally, it, it, it will be biting off a big chunk that it's going to have to then chew on and, and we're going to have to be very, very helpful uh, to them. As I say, we, we would welcome it. Thank you. Uh, Mike, we'll let Mike ask a question. because okay. Mike Morrow, uh, U.S. Department of State and currently seconded here to the Wilson Center. Um, first, I uh, wanted to thank you for your comments today and also thank you for your tremendous work uh, in your role over the last eight years in a region of the world that I've always felt is, is the toughest neighborhood uh, on the globe, bar none. So thank you for that. Um, wanted to ask about South Sudan. Um, it's in the news again today because the uh, U.S. Department of State has announced that we are recalling our ambassador from Juba uh, to uh, express our unhappiness with the lack of progress toward implementation mm -hmm. of the peace agreement. Um, my question is not about that. My question is about Salva Kiir. Mm -hmm. And by focusing on Salva Kiir, I don't mean to say that he is necessarily you know, the, the primary cause of all the problems. I mean, the South Sudan conundrum is far too complex to pin it on any single individual. 
But, but Selva Kir does, by far and away, uh, uh, I think, you know, hold all the cards in South Sudan, or, or at least he holds the best hand politically. And that in itself uh, becomes a disincentive for him to, um, to compromise or, or, or make any real uh, uh, personal or political sacrifices. And then in addition to that, uh, I, I think in his mind, he sees you know, any solution that includes him stepping down from power ends up with him behind bars. And that becomes a, becomes a disincentive for him to, to step down or give up power. And in fact, you know, his original electoral mandate as president ran out a number of years ago, but for as long as the peace process kind of staggers forward or runs in place, he gets frozen into the office of presidency. So my question is, how do you navigate uh, the South Sudan peace process um, when you've got a situation where such a powerful figure as Salva Kiir has no, little or no apparent incentive to um, affect change? How do you deal with that? Thank you. Um, first, I think President Salva Kiir is going to have to work out fairly soon whether he feels he's got whether he feels he's got the, um, the wherewithal to actually take the country to the next stage. It, it, it's at a tipping point right now, it's absolutely clear. Um, there is an opportunity to begin to gather together all the parties and begin a whole process that could perhaps begin to stabilize. Does he feel he can do that? And I mean, does he personally think he can do that? Secondly, to what extent is he beholden to his own constituency? Sometimes leaders become prisoners of their own constituency. And, and this is one of the issues that, again, he needs to ask himself, as well as we asking him of that, uh, asking him the same question. Secondly, I think, and related, uh, South Sudan has very, very influential neighbors who have played a very important role, positively or negatively, in the fate and even the, what has unfolded in South Sudan. And therefore, I think uh, the time comes, and it's happened before in other parts of Africa and also in this region, where the neighbors need to decide whether they need to step up to the plate and decide what is in their collective interest for the interests of the citizens of South Sudan and make the appropriate moves. OK, I'm going to go to right to the back to say if you're having to walk down, Mary. Hi, thank you so much for that conversation. Um, my name is Valentina, I work at APCO Worldwide. Uh, and my question is, how can the EU, EU partner with coalition organizations in Africa, like the African Union, to make sure the responsibility and accountability remain in the hands of Africa when dealing with existential um, security threats of this century that's plaguing the continent, specifically the Horn of Africa? Thank you. We, we, we do a lot of work. If your question is about working, let's say, with the, with the African Union, correct? Yeah. Yeah, we do an awful lot of work with the African Union. Um, we, 10 years ago, got into the whole security side by supporting Amazon. Uh, you know, 20,000 African troops are actually being supported by the European Union and the United States, each in our own way. We're doing that, but that's what... I think keeps Amazon going. Now, my point there is, as time has gone by, the relationship with the African Union has, has moved from being one of sort of rhetorical sympathy to practical cooperation. And as we bump into, you know, into various new realities or get mugged by them, so we will have to adapt and see how that relationship builds. It's there, it's the bedrock of a relationship. I, I'm, I'm saying this beyond the usual talk about how nice multilateralism is. It's actually really important that there be a, an entity like the African Union, which is able then to, to provide a sort of a chapeau through which one can conduct a whole lot of, um, much of the cooperation. Now, beyond security, there's trade, that, that trade and investment. That's the biggest issue. And the African Union is a very, very important conduit. At the very least, that is where Africans gather in order to be able to negotiate among themselves in order to be able to negotiate with us. And that's the core. And, and this is where we're, we're getting to 
if that addresses your question again. No. Mary, stay there, because you can use mine. Thank you. Marta Verbetic Wilson Center. Um, question about Brexit. If it happens, when it happens, will it have any influence towards the policy of the Horn of Africa and uh, the European Union's policies? I don't know if this is true, or maybe it's wishful thinking on f of some parties, or perhaps it's concern of other parties that Britain might recognize Somaliland. Um, Brexit is going to have a very significant effect. I mean, I, I speak as someone who thinks it damages both the UK and it damages Europe. That's my own view. In Africa, it's going to have... The Horn of Africa is an area where, within the European Union, the United Kingdom played a very, very important role in keeping people focused on it. Um, and, and by championing a region, when the champion leaves and steps out, there is a very, very interesting issue that emerges uh, for the European Union, but also for the countries of the region. Because what they're asking themselves is, what do we bet on now? Is it the UK alone that can deliver, or is it this behemoth called the EU? And if there is, it is the behemoth called the EU, who in the EU? You know, it, these are the debates that go on. So it's impossible to answer directly the question. It'll, it'll sort of unpack itself in time. There's no doubt, though, the, the, there will be cooperation that goes on. There'll, there's life after Brexit with the UK. Um, reality will actually dictate that on both sides. It'll be triangular. It'll be the EU, the UK, and the region. And out of that, slowly, in that cuisine, things will emerge. We go to the back. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. You've given us a, a clear picture of how many things might keep you awake uh, in the evening. Uh, my name is Kent Hughes. I'm here at the Wilson Center. We've been looking at this question of economy and aspirations being unmet in, the, in the, much of the Arab Middle East. And the, you seem to be calling for a national, regional, sometimes global effort on an investment-led growth that would really start matching education with opportunities. With that idea, what are the three things you'd like the U.S. in particular to do to move in that direction? One is, at one level, it's a purely psychological thing. Um, I would beg of the US to show repeatedly that it is concerned and engaged, because there are many in Africa who wonder whether there is a disengagement occurring. Um, this is in terms of political psychology. It's very, very important that that, that appears. And, and I come back to my original uh, point, which is that in the region there is an entire generation emerging who I think would, would really welcome that. Um, you know, it, it, there's no point in casting aspersions, but th there are other parts of the world to which a younger, educated African may not see his future being shaped. Okay? So that's one. Two. Um, it's not about how much money one puts in, but it's the quality of money that one mobilizes. It's quality, not just the quantity of it. And I think there again, the US needs to be very, very engaged. Th third, um, terrorism is there. But what we're discovering, and I'm, you all know it, being involved, many of you with Africa, that Terrorist groups often emerge out of plain bad local government. This sim simplistically put. Um, there's no reason that Shabab needed to become what it became. That doesn't mean we're to blame. That's what happened. But that, it does mean that we need to take a much wider view of what we mean by 
counterterrorism. Uh, likewise, to be quite frank, I mean, um, this, this debate about violent extremism, um, to me, that's all sort of euphemistic blather, if I may put it that way. Um, let's get forensic here. If it's violent extremism, is it violent religious extremism? In which case, who, where, how, supported by, by what? Let's get targeted and very clear about this sort of thing. Um, because it, it just, it, it tends to sometimes dilute what could, needs to be a very sharpened uh, discussion. But my point is, we can keep trying to kill members of Shabab, but at what point do we reach a point of diminishing returns? And I'm not saying that just about the, the US. It is a general issue. And I use Shabab as just one example. Have we got our strategies in order? And there I just make, you know, refer, come back to the point I was making earlier. These outfits are no longer really being financed from abroad. They've become self-financing. Time to pick that apart fast and find out who their local collaborators are. They're not ideological. There are others who are in business doing that. Hello, I'm a student at Loyola, Maryland, and my question actually has to do with Chinese influence. So if we have more Chinese influence in the Horn of Africa, what does it mean for those individual countries? That, that's, the, that's one of the biggest questions around. I'm glad you raise it. Um, there's a danger of misrepresenting China, it, so the, it, it just becomes part of a, a, a global demonology, as it were. China is there. It's in Africa. I think China is itself discovering something, which is that simply saying that we're investing because a country wants it, they're discovering that different people within these different countries have different views about what is the nature of its investment. Um, and I think that is where there's a, a very interesting discussion to be had uh, w with China. Um, developments in places like Sudan or Ethiopia or even South Sudan have, have reminded China that you cannot separate commerce from, polit uh, from political realities. Um, that was the fate of the East India Company 150, 180 years ago. So it will be with others who who think that you can keep that separation. Um, and, and I think, therefore, this is why I was suggesting earlier, we're actually at a very, very interesting strategic moment where a real discussion can begin with all those people who want to invest in Africa. Um, who are we to say they shouldn't? Okay. The question is, can we all decide on some rules to this game that will therefore benefit the Africans? And I don't say that out of an act of charity for Africa. It is in everyone's collective interest that Africa, which is going to have 2 billion citizens in 20 years' time, 25 years' time, is a place that is stable and is offering some degree of prosperity to its citizens. If not, they're all going to be on the move within their countries, beyond their countries, beyond the continent. That's a migration issue, but it speaks to a much deeper unsettlement. And I think that's a conversation that needs to be put straight on the table. But finger pointing to me is just pointless. I mean, uh, you know, uh, we've got to get way beyond that. Thank you. Good to see you, Alex, and thank you for your insights, as always. Paul Sutfin from CNO Resources, former state. A, a couple related questions. There has been, I'd like to hear more about your thoughts about the Gulf's engagement, especially in Sudan. Um, Qatar's been active there in terms of peace sponsorship for a long time, but it seems like the new military authorities or the revised military authorities have looked to the Saudis and the Emiratis especially, and not so much to the Qataris anymore. 
And secondly, is there a common purpose and set of messaging between the EU and the US now regarding the Gulf role in Sudan and going forward, especially in terms of supporting the civilians? Uh, the answer to the last question is yes. And in fact, I was in the Gulf recently with, um, uh, not, uh, with, uh, with the US envoy. Uh, yeah. Um, partly to convey certain messages. Uh, and, and in Sudan, it, it's really fairly straightforward as an objective, which is that if Sudan, Sudan in order to eventually become eligible for any support from the international financial institutions because it's sitting there with a 60 billion debt that has to get cleared in one way or another, um, it's, got, it's a country that has to go from running itself off budget to on budget. We have the same issue with Somalia. S Steve Schwartz here, who's ambassador there, knows this. Um, now, in order to do that, we need our friends in the Gulf to help in making sure the country gets on budget. In Sudan, 60-70% of the official budget is related to anything related to security. And that probably is just a tip of the iceberg of the way money flows in, in Sudan. So we need to work together so that Sudan begins to demonstrate that it is managing its economy in such a way that is transparent and certainly meets the standards of people who understand economics a lot better than I do. Um, but, but so that's point one. In order to do that, the first thing that really has to be achieved in Sudan is to get um, peace agreements. The reason there is so much security investment, or rather the alibi for all the security investment, was this 30-year civil war. All the stars are in effect aligned to put an end to it. Now, there again, the Gulf can be very helpful because some of the parties in that conflict are look to the Gulf for patronage and the like. So there is a, there is a discussion that is continuing the whole time with them on that. And it's not a closed door either. It's, it's a backwards and forwards. At the end of the day, it's about also how you eliminate, a lot eliminate, get control of who are the cartels who are running and have been running the economy of Sudan over the last 25 years. So we're into our last few minutes. I'm gonna take a couple of questions together a couple of times and then hopefully that will, that will do it. Ambassador, and we'll take you and then the lady, I think, behind, so, thank you. Hi, Alex, thanks, thanks a lot, Steve. good to see you again. Uh, I'm not gonna ask you about Somalia, I'm gonna ask you about Ethiopia, mm -hmm. and how you see Prime Minister Abe's uh, ability going forward to manage both an ambitious domestic agenda and a regional agenda, uh, which seems at times overwhelming. Mm -hmm. There's a lady just there, Mary, thank you. Hi, thank you for the um, conversation. It's been fascinating. Um, my name's Claire Ayer and I'm at Notre Dame. I was just wondering if you could speak to the prospects for the debt restructuring and what happens if the sovereign debt that you mentioned isn't actually restructured. You're talking about the region or Sudan in particular? Uh, the region. The region, yeah. Um, let me start on, on Ethiopia. Uh, Steve, that's a, it's a very difficult one. Here, here's this country that is 100 million people and it's like a dam that if it does not, if the center does not hold, then things fall apart, okay? To, to, to quote a succession of, of great writers. Um, uh, Prime Minister Abiy knows that, okay? I think he also came into power uh, n understanding that the nature of the federalism that had been built up in Somalia was one that runs the risk of, of entrenching uh, an inevitable ethnic fragmentation. Um, nevertheless, in a country which has its own deep history and, and, and its own inequalities. Um, so 
he's having to balance how do you create a new sense of what is a nation and an identity of what it is to be an Ethiopian. And, and it's devilishly difficult to do, and we're seeing it play out. Um, and I wouldn't want to rush to any conclusions too soon, except to say that we all ought to be encouraging him to, it's all about how you develop momentum towards an idea politically, because if you stand still, then things tend to go wrong. Um, on the other hand, too much momentum too soon provokes a sort of, you know, things start to move and ricochet in ways that, uh, that could become dangerous. And I think we're at that point. It, it behooves us, I think. Um, let me put it this way. Certainly I speak as the European Union, but I'd say the same in the United States. If we all were to agree that um, <clears throat> this is a country at a, at a very, very delicate moment, and not just for its own sake, but for the security of the wider region, um, it, 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 Prime Minister Abiy is entitled to our opinion. And we should be rather clear about what our interests are. Um, and I think, I wonder sometimes whether we are uh, active and clear enough as to what those are. But then so are other parties in Ethiopia. And I, I sometimes worry that we are, we're dealing with Ethiopia, given our interests, I'm talking purely about interests here, with a degree of kid gloves, which actually does a disservice to Ethiopia, but also to our own interests. I think it's just time to, to be fairly open, pretty direct, I say open in private discussions, this is not for public lecturing. Um, but th this is a country that is so important. If the dam breaks, all the discussions about the Corn of Africa are moot. It's as simple as that. This is not Yugoslavia which imploded. Ethiopia straddles every other country around it. It will be infected by that. Um, that's the core strategic question. And, and there again, I think, you know, we owe it to ourselves and also to the Ethiopians, and actually that region, the stability of the region, I think to be perhaps a little more, more active, more vocal, in, in just conveying how we see things. Debt. Debt. Ah, now you're asking someone who can barely keep his own checkbook in order. So, um, look, w what I know is this, and I forgive the sheer simplicity of the way I put it. Um, 20 years ago was the famous Jubilee campaign to eliminate debt and everything, and an awful lot of that was done. Now we find ourselves with alarmingly high debt ratios to GDP ratios. Um, and we have to work out how we got there. Did this just sort of creep up under our noses? We know that various, all sorts of countries have been involved in this. We also know that governments um, in, in the region have become aware that they've sort of climbed in you know, I, I, I once said, and I th I'm sure I caused offense, so I'll do it again, but, you know, we, we offer good nutritional meals, but it's a bit boring. Others offer cocaine, <laughs> okay? You get hooked on cocaine, it's damn difficult to get off it. This is the debt issue, because who is it that took on the debt? It wasn't the people. No one went and had a referendum on it in Africa, so let's... Let's start getting focused. Who engaged in that debt? Who got bought off? Prime Minister Abiy is absolutely explicit about it. He wants to know who are the officials who signed off on sovereign debt loans. And he's right to ask that question. Um, and perhaps others should be asking that too. So the debt question is, is one that yes, there'll be, de re you know, I'm sure it'll get to restructuring, and China will be engaged in those discussions, and the IMF, everyone eventually will get engaged in it. 
I, I'm perhaps a bit of a cynic in all of this. People will kick the can down the road. They'll talk about restructuring a debt, but will they restructure the political economy that created the debt? That's the real issue. And I come from Greece, and I know about this one. And I know that we didn't scratch the surface of who benefited and who didn't. And so I, I come with a certain passion into this one. Let's not make the mistake again. Um, because these, these are countries, if, if the citizens are going to pay the price of that debt, and you know, because the family jewels were, ta were taken to the pawn shop by a group of leaders, well, why should they pay the price? That's a very political, personal reaction to what I'm sure the economists and the financial gurus uh, will, will give you fancy language on. But that is the next train wreck, if this is not handled smartly. That is why, actually, if we want to help, let's make the next generation of Africa financially literate so that they know how to ask the right questions about every darn decision that's made. Don't know if that helps you. But. I'm sorry, but we're out of time. And the reason is I know that Alex has quite a schedule or schedule. So I never know which one it is in America uh, for today. Um, I remember over eight years ago sitting in the back of a car with you driving through Athens when you talked about your passion for a part of the world where you'd grown up and my being in awe of your combination, which I think is unique, of entrepreneur and diplomat rolled into one. Eight years on, I remain in awe of you, Alex. You are the best of us. Many, many thanks. Thank you, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes, indeed. Happy Thanksgiving to you all.